So how many of you guys have heard of DeFi, short for Decentralized Finance? And if so, are you wondering why there's been so much buzz about it lately, particularly in the Ethereum world? Well, that's because out of all the dApps out there, this particular subset is the most promising and adopted so far. And so if you're curious to learn more about this topic, then all you have to do is just keep on watching. Hi everyone, my name is Kevin. I'm with Bitcoin for Beginners here to bring you interesting and informative content with no frills nor fluff. Now, while you're watching this video, if you find it helpful whatsoever, then you could do me a quick favor by smashing the like button and subscribing down below if you haven't already. All right, so now let's dive into DeFi. So what is DeFi on a high level? Well, it all started with Bitcoin and this underlying blockchain technology. This inspired a lot of imagination and innovation out in this crypto world. And then Ethereum came along with the smart contracts capabilities, which expanded upon those initial possibilities. So the question is, can those technologies be utilized for applications that usually require the legacy financial sector? Enter Decentralized Finance or DeFi. These are financial instruments on a decentralized network. It allows you to do many things like store, hedge, borrow, lend, transfer, collateralize, insure, and much more. So here's just a snapshot from the block crypto, and you can see all these different segments of the DeFi space. You have payments, infrastructures, KYC, stable coins, insurance. I'm not gonna read all of them, but there's a ton of projects going on that are trying to build and innovate in the space. A few notable ones. In terms of payments, there's Lightning Network and State Channels. Custodial, there's wallets, derivatives, DYDX, stable coins like Tether and DAI, collateralizing like MakerDAO, credit and lending like Dharma, fundraising, ICOs, exchanges, 0x and Bancor. Basically, you can see that instruments and functions of the regular financial world have decentralized equivalents being built. So these can be categorized into two separate buckets, native versus hybrid. Native crypto assets are ones that are issued, settled, traded directly on the blockchain. Hybrid ones can be crypto wrapped around traditional assets, which means that it operates on the blockchain, but the underlying assets traditional, like stable coins, for example. It can also be the other way, which means traditional wrapped around crypto. This operates in the traditional financial system, but the underlying asset is crypto, for example, Bitcoin futures or Bitcoin ETF. So now let's take a deeper dive into some of these projects. First one, Lightning Network. This is scalable payments for Bitcoin. Developed by Lightning Naps, it's open source and a second layer solution. The Bitcoin network, as we all know, was clogged down in 2017 because of high demand and usage. So the solution is to have a second layer to focus on high volume, smaller transactions. The Lightning Network can theoretically handle millions of small transactions off-chain and finally settle them on-chain for security. We also have another video talking about Lightning Network, so I encourage you to go take a look if you're curious to learn more. In 2019, over 750,000 worth of BTC is locked in Lightning Network payment channels, and the number of channels is growing fast. This is great adoption. Also, the development is still ongoing, still constantly improving and trying to make it safer, faster, and better. State channels aim to achieve the same purpose for Ethereum. Now, MakerDAO slash DAI. This is debt collateralization and decentralized stablecoin. They use a complex arbitrage system in which investors lock in Ether as collateral in return for newly minted DAI, which is pegged to $1. They can unlock their Ether by returning the DAI, which is then removed from supply or burned. There's no real USD that's used as collateral. The system is completely decentralized. The system kept DAI stablecoin stable, despite the underlying asset Ether dropping more than 90% from its all-time high. There's 218 million worth of Ether, which is roughly 2% of the whole circulating supply, locked as debt collateral backing DAI coins. This is one of the most successful DeFi projects out there. The Maker token governs the monetary policy of the DAI stablecoin. Maker shares have been outperforming BTC since September 2018 and is now at a new all-time high in terms of BTC value. The performance of the DAI stablecoin since May 2018 after the first month has arranged from $0.96 cents to $1.06, 99.9% .9 of the time. Very impressive. And with a maximum peak of $1.10. Here's just a screenshot of the DAI USD and it stays pretty stable around the 1 USD value. Next up is 0x. Trading and speculation is by far the biggest use of cryptocurrency so far. 
But centralized exchanges are better than DEXs in terms of liquidity, speed, user experience, customer support, and more. Zero X makes the order book and order matching relayed off chain and executes a trade settled on chain. This allows order book pooling, which is higher liquidity and higher speed as well. And also it can function in the background of a wallet without the user knowing. This is great for UX and better for adoption. Users also keep full control of their funds and their private keys. The vision is to operate in a tokenized economy where different tokens are required for many services. And so Zero X will make it easy for you to access those different tokens without even knowing about it. Over $180 million worth of value has been transacted through the Zero X smart contracts already. Pretty impressive. Next up, DYDX and Augur. DYDX issues derivatives or options and enables short selling and lending in a decentralized manner. The order book and order matching happens off-chain and settlement on-chain. It's also completely transparent compared to legacy clearinghouses, another benefit. In terms of Augur, this is prediction markets, which can be applied pretty broadly, but it can also be used to enable hedging tools, like you can issue the equivalent of a put option on a certain stock. They have handled over $106 million in bets during the midterm elections. Finally, Dharma and the SET protocol. Dharma has to do with issuing and crowdsourcing loans and debt by tokenization. The debtor finds an underwriter and the underwriter assesses credit risk and then the underwriter issues a loan offer. The loan offer is relayed in the network, the investors fund the loan, and then the token is issued by the smart contracts. It makes this all work via tokens. On the other hand, the SET protocol makes it so that anyone can issue tokens that are collateralized by a basket of other tokens via smart contracts. This enables the issuance of so-called decentralized index fund tokens. So why is DeFi so interesting? It's one of the fastest growing segments of the blockchain space with a few of the most successful dApps. It enables hedging tools that can be used by investors natively on chain. It's interesting for investors, which opens up a wide range of investment, trading, and speculation possibilities besides just pure buying and selling that we've all done in the past. This could lead to more market maturity with more advanced tools. Also builders, who gets the ultimate freedom to build anything they want with no permission required from anyone, contrary to legacy systems, which requires a lot of permissions, and also enables flexible funding models like ICOs, and it relies on existing infrastructure. DeFi, on the other hand, is open source, permissionless, trustless, not quite scalable yet, and the infrastructure has to be built from scratch. But DeFi does have some advantages. In terms of access to financial services, DeFi is permissionless, so no one is restricted. Also, it doesn't have any risk of censorship because transactions cannot be rescinded and services cannot be stopped. There is an increasing use case as we've seen with the financial censorship of like WikiLeaks, political commentators, and more. Also, there's less of a counterparty risk because DeFi is trustless. There's no need for a third-party validation of truth. Also, this is much more transparent because by using public blockchains, those are transparent, auditable, including the services and instruments built on top. Finally, it's programmable, so its architecture is inherently plug and play, which makes it easy and cheap to build additional services, instruments, innovation on top. So what will happen in this space? Well, as we've talked about already, DeFi is currently worse for performance and network effects, but once the tech gets better, the network effect will increase as well. This process may take years though. DeFi will likely enable more economic freedom than the legacy financial system currently does. Therefore, DeFi will likely expand the global financial industry. However, DeFi and public blockchain won't be a solution for everyone's issue, of course. So the legacy finance and fintech sectors will still be relevant. They can all work together. In fact, they may merge their hybrid service layers on top of the public blockchain someday. Just like the telecom companies did when the internet came to fruition. So everyone, thanks for watching this video about DeFi. I'm very excited about this space. What do you think about the DeFi space? And are you involved in the innovation? Which of these projects do you like the most? Let me know down in the comments below. Thank you guys for watching. This is Kevin. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll catch you guys next time.